All right. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about metagenomics. So here we're going to shift gears into uh, FTMS data and analysis. And to kick off our talk, we have um, Daniel Claiborne and Natalie Winans. We'll be talking about a tool Frida, specifically how we convert our data that we got from day three from Core MS to Frida and then process it through um, the Frida pipeline. And then Damon and I will kick in with what we do with the data afterwards. So go ahead and feel free to start, Daniel. All right, thanks, David. Let me share my screen and go to presenter mode here. All right, everyone see the slideshow? Yep, looks good. Thank or you. Any one person? All right, thank you. All right, so like David said, uh, we're going to be talking about um, exploratory data analysis, specifically done through an app that we've developed here at uh, PNNL called Frida. Get into what that stands for later, but yeah, it's it's just an app for the analysis of Fourier transform uh, mass spectrometry data. All right, so just a, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a data scientist in the newly newly minted uh, foundational data science group, formerly uh, of I am formerly of the Applied Statistics and Computational Modeling Group. I came here out of a, a stats master's at at uh, Oregon State. Uh, and when I got here, the, the first thing I did was to develop uh, software and web tools, which obviously I'm still doing now. I'd like to present it to you. Uh, web tools for, for biology applications. Um, and I still do that, but uh, now I split my time between that um, and some machine learning stuff in vision, audio, uh, and text for, for national security projects. All right, uh, and with me is Natalie, uh, who I will let introduce herself. Thank you, Daniel. So my name is Natalie Winans, and I'm a postmaster's RA in the data science and biostats team on the computational biology group. Um, and so I have an MS in bioinformatics and genomics from the University of Oregon. And I currently work on a lot of software development for chemistry and biology applications and have a second project um, doing nanopore signal processing and sequence analysis for some national security applications. Cool, thank you. All right, so just to kind of rebase uh, on where we are here. So uh, uh, David kind of gave this overview, but this is going to be the uh, exploratory data analysis portion of, of you know, kind of analyzing this free transform mass spectrometry data. Um, and then after this talk, we're going to get uh, we're going to get into you know, more formal uh, uh, analyses, specifically differential differential abundance. Uh, and then later in the day, kind of what I present here, you, you'll sort of get a chance to, to sort of do it hands on. All right, so you've probably got an earful of this um, from you know Yuri and other people, but I, I thought it would be worthwhile to just recap, you know, Fourier transform mass spectrometry. What is it? Um, so there are there is sets of instruments that can basically identify masses of ions with, with high resolution, uh, and they can also identify a molecular formula. And this is basically due to small differences in in uh, compounds with the same, same nominal mass. Um, so pictured here is one of the uh, uh, FT-ICR uh, machines. So I think the two, two main technologies are ICR and, and Orbit Trap. Um, so originally this package was called FT-ICR MS analysis, but um, then these people had to come and start using this Orbit Trap thing. So it made the more general name <laughs> FT-MSR analysis. Um, 
but they both work on that kind of similar principle. You, you have these ions, um, in the case of FTICR, they're, they're charged and, and sent into this magnetic field, and they move in a predictable way such that you can um, infer their mass. Uh, as I said, I'm not a statistician, so you know um, uh, that's my service level understanding of the technology. But we get the data that comes out, and I am good at analyzing that. All right. So, uh, Frida, what is it? So, again, this is a acronym. So, it's the FTMS. And we've crammed an initialism into an acronym here. So, the FTMSR, which is the uh, programming language that we developed this in, uh, exploratory data analysis. Um, specifically, R has a library which allows uh, people like me who are statisticians and not web developers to um, easily develop some pretty cool uh, applications based off our software. Um, and in short, what this app does uh, is it takes data from FTMS instruments with a couple steps between the data coming off the instrument and, and getting to the app, but we'll get into that later. Um, and we just perform common pre-processing, quality control, and as is the main subject of this talk, uh, exploratory analyses. Um, as I said, it runs on some R, R packages, R software, um, specifically uh, an R package called FTMS R analysis, formerly FTICR analysis, uh, R package. Um, and during this talk, we're gonna we're gonna just highlight some of the functions that we use to produce the output you see in this presentation, um, highlighted in the familiar curly and you font. Um, and there's a link to the, the package at the bottom of this slide here. So, okay, as I mentioned, there's a couple steps uh, uh, from when the data comes off the instrument to when it gets into Frida. Um, and so, uh, more recently, the first one of those first steps is, is the CoreMS uh, pipeline, which you're all uh, probably familiar with uh, at this point. Uh, just to give a little visual reminder, I'm not going to go too much into the slide because uh, Yuri has done that for you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, but yes, uh, uh, CoreMS, I'll just do one of the bullet points here. Uh, it's a software tool in active development down there at the bottom for uh, molecular identification, uh, among many other things. Okay, so it goes through CoreMS, and then we need to do uh, a little bit more pre processing to get it into the format that Frida uh, needs in order to do what it does. Uh, and so we've developed a little bit of a pre processing pipeline. For that, which I'm going to uh, actually pass off to Emily to, to talk about. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so like Daniel was just saying, um, the ultimate goal is to have these pipelines kind of unified and connected. So we have some um, additional functionality that's been added to FTMS R analysis, but isn't quite available for public use yet. And we're calling this the CoreMS to Frida pipeline aptly because it takes CoreMS output data and um, kind of converts it into format that can be used in Frida. So I'll talk a little bit about what that entails. Um, and I'll just note here that because this isn't available yet, we will have done this for you. So the data you'll be working with in the breakout sessions later today will already be um, ready to go for Frida. Next slide, please. So the crux of the issue here is that CoreMS outputs potential molecular formula assignments with those confidence scores, um, which is you know, kind of a unique feature of CoreMS. But um, this means that um, these data sets often include multiple possible molecular formulas per peak. Um, and then Frida requires that its input data contains um, a single peak, um, sorry, a single molecular formula per peak and also that each molecular formula occurs no more than once per sample. 
And so in order to reconcile these, um, we have this new core MS to Frida functionality that reduces the data set to a single formula assignment per peak. And it does this based on robust decision criteria. So um, for example, using that confidence score as a filtering method. And then finally, it converts um, that core MS data into a format compatible with Frida functions. Next slide, please. So the general workflow, um, of course, involves uploading your core MS output data um, into the FTMS R analysis um, package in R. Um, you then filter by confidence score. Um, and then importantly, you want to assign those unique molecular formulas to each peak. And then finally, there's that format conversion for FRIDA compatibility. I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these steps. So you heard all about core mass from Yuri yesterday and hopefully got to play around a little bit. So you may have seen some of this data in action, but this is just kind of a generalized view of what that core mass output data will look like, um, truncated to fit on the slide, of course. Um, but so ultimately, uh, you have that M over Z column that represents those peak mass to charge ratios. And then you also have assigned molecular formulas. Um, calculated confidence scores, and then lots of additional peak metadata. So these files can contain, uh, you know, many more columns containing those peak metadata, but these are just kind of the core uh, values that you'll want to see. And so the FTMS R analysis package contains a couple functions for um, reading in your data. So that read core MS data function can take actually multiple sample files and it concatenates those. And then you'll use that as core MS data function to um, convert um, that file, that data frame into um, a format that can be used in the uh, functions downstream. Next slide, please. So the next step is to conduct con uh, confidence filtering. And this happens in a way very similar to um, the implementation of other filtering methods um, in this package. So for the first step is to create a conf filter object um, from your core MS data object using this conf filter function. And then secondly, you will apply that filter um, using this apply filter function. And that takes a fil the filter object created by conf filter. It takes your core MS data object and then a minimum confidence value, um, which you can kind of play around with to, to dial in. We'll talk more about that later. And then that will return your filtered core MS data object. Next slide, please. And so then the most important step really is this unique molecular formula assignment. So we have the aptly named function unique MF assignment, and this takes your core MS data object and then uh, one of three methods, either confidence, peak intensity, or prevalence. And so what this will do is select um, the molecular formula that corresponds to the highest confidence score, peak height, or prevalence across samples respectively. Next slide, please. And so then finally, you have your data formatting. So this core MS data to FDMS data function will take your core MS data object and convert it into an FDMS data object. And that will be structured as a list of three data frames. So firstly, you have your E data, which is your expression data, your F data, which is your sample data, and your E meta, which is your molecular identification data. And I will kind of briefly go over what those look like in the next couple slides. So your E data is your expression data. And this data frame um, consists of rows that correspond to each of the unique peaks that were observed with a mass column that contains your unique M over Z values. And so then the remaining columns correspond to your samples. Um, we just have three pictured here, but you can have as many samples as, as you need. And then, of course, the values um, in the remaining cells are the peak intensities. Next slide, please. So the E-meta data frame contains your molecular identification data. And so this will have, um, again, your mass column that contains those unique M over Z values um, that are kind of being used as your identifiers. And then each column corresponds to um, the mm -hmm. elements found um, within your peaks. And these are elemental counts. Um, so it's basically like your deconstructed molecular formulas. And then your E meta is also where you will see um, additional columns that contain other core MS um, output peak metadata, 
Um, so you can have uh, you know, quite a few columns in this data frame that are not pictured here. Next slide, please. And lastly, you have your F data, which is your kind of sample metadata. So in this file, each of your rows corresponds to um, a unique sample represented by your sample IDs. And then your columns um, can contain any additional sample metadata that's included in the data set. So um, you can have as few as one additional metadata column and um, no upper limit. So um, I will pass this back to Daniel to talk about what happens next um, when we get into freedom. All right, so yes. So uh, to recap, you know, we have now this essentially three three separate pieces of data. Um, and the e-meta, which is your peak intensities, F data, your metadata about your samples, uh, and e-meta, which is uh, metadata about each peak. Um, and I'll have some examples of, of that later. Um, so no, so if this is ready to ingest into Frida. Uh, and like I mentioned before, what we're going to be doing is do some pre-processing, quality control, um, and exploratory analysis. And I'll describe what that means. Uh, a big part of that, uh, especially in Frida, is, is a lot of the visualization capabilities. So, you know, you essentially want to make uh, uh, various types of plots from this data and, and see if there's some sort of structure here. Our goal here is not to do kind of formal statistical analysis. Uh, although Frida has a little bit of that capability, but really we're just looking for patterns and, and, and structure in the data. Um, and one of the big ways we do that is through visual inspection of, of plots. Okay. Um, general workflow. Uh, so we're going to upload that those peak intensities, that E data, uh, values related to each peak. Um, we're going to specify groupings of the samples. So uh, sometimes that's going to be uh, identified in that F data, right? So you have your samples in that F data. Um, sometimes you'll have a column in there that indicates, uh, you know, for example, which samples belong to a control group or which samples belong to the, to the treatment group. Um, and that can be used to um, do some basic group comparisons within Frida. Uh, we can calculate a lot of new variables of interest. Uh, so we come in and usually we'll have things like uh, elemental counts, maybe a formula, um, some different measurements of mass. Um, but oftentimes, and we've gotten basically these things exist in the app because of requests by, by biologists um, to include variables like, uh, example here, nominal oxidation state of carbon. Um, uh, before plotting uh, and for other analyses, we also want to filter out undesirable peaks uh, or samples. Uh, there's some sort of rules of thumb um, for which peaks to filter out. Uh, and, and also um, with the variables that you calculated or with variables um, uh, associated to each peak, um, you know, you can use those also as, as filtering criteria. Uh, I'll show you an example later. Um, and of course, finally, we want to use this to explore some plots. All right, so uh, for this particular presentation, uh, the example data set I'm going to use is, is a, a soils data set um, uh, done a while ago here at PML. Um, these are soil samples from Rattlesnake Mountain, which is a uh, uh, local geological formation. Um, as a brief summary, they essentially took samples from two elevations from Rattlesnake Mountain, each of which have different temperature conditions. Uh, and then they, they're going to move those samples. So they take these soil samples and they transplant them from where they originally were uh, to the other elevation. So some of the samples from the lower elevation they took and moved to the higher elevation. Some of the samples that started at the higher elevation they took and transplanted to, to the lower elevation. Um, and then some other things, of course, uh, they wanted to control for the transplant effect. Um, that's what they called it. Um, you know, do you, 
if you observe differences between these samples that you transplanted and that came from the lower or the upper locations, um, is that difference because of the location? Um, or is it simply due to the fact that you've transplanted these things? There's some effect of, of just digging up the soil. Um, and so kind of the overall uh, 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 theme of this this study was that different temperatures act as sort of a surrogate for the effects of climate change on on soil organic matter. Um, and in the next presentation, you'll actually see even more detail about this. But I wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of, of what this data is. Uh, a, a visual of this: there's Rattlesnake Mountain. They take uh, core samples from the lower and upper sites, uh, and as you can see, uh, the lower site. Uh, uh, is meant to uh, simulate sort of warmer conditions. Um, and they have, for this particular extraction type, uh, six samples um, uh, for, uh, for example, here from the upper control, which is just soil samples from the upper site that they didn't transplant, and six samples that they took from the upper site and transplanted to the lower site. Okay. All right. So you've seen this one before. Here's an, this is this is an example of the, the E data. We have, you know, as now we explained, our M over Z on the first column indicating uh, each peak, and then peak intensities uh, for each of the samples. Again, uh, peak information. We have things like elemental counts, the presence of carbon thirteen. Um, and read information like mass, area, and exact mass. And just to do a little bit of detail about the connection between that E data file and the E meta file, you have this mass column that essentially indicates the ID. So you could um, sort of join these tables on the mass column. Uh, but the point is that for mass 218.9025, you have particular peak intensities for all the samples, and then you also have um, information about carbon counts, hydrogen counts, uh, presence of carbon-13 for that peak. All right. So we upload all these files into Frida. One of the things, first things you might want to do as a pre-processing step is to log transform uh, the data. And so why would you want to do this? Uh, I'll explain, you know, uh, it can sort of be explained by just looking at the bottom graph. You can look at it and, and think to yourself, hmm, you know, this doesn't look too good for analyzing the data. Uh, the short answer is, is that log transforms um, kind of make your data more normal. Uh, and normality of data um, is generally good for running statistical tests. Uh, and of course, you can choose the base of your logarithm. And of course, you have, to be, you have to be careful when you do that. Well, not careful, but you just have to keep in mind that when your data is log transformed, for example, uh, if you uh, transform it to log base two, then a one unit increase in a measurement of that log transformed data uh, means a doubling of the raw values. Um, uh, yeah, so you just have to keep that in mind. And uh, at the bottom there, we've, we've provided this function in, in uh, FTMSR analysis. So in the back end of Frida, what's happening is all these files are getting kind of clumped together in an object. That object gets fed into the function uh, eData transform and does these transformations for you. All right, so you log transform the data. <laughs> Obviously, the, the, this view of the data is much more, more palatable. Um, uh, you can't tell from this previous plot that these are box plots. Um, and you say, really, those are box plots? No, these are box plots. Uh, uh, another common pre-processing step is to remove peaks that have uh, carbon-13 present. Uh, my understanding is that essentially you're going to see these ghost peaks from just natural occurrence of, of, of carbon-13. Um, you know, we want to move them because essentially we have not actually identified two separate molecules of interest in this case. Um, 
this little ghost peak uh, uh, in the image here is, is just a result of the, the natural occurrence of, of carbon-13 um, as opposed to uh, carbon-12. Uh, good news is, uh, actually, since we've adopted the core MS pipeline, these, these peaks are actually automatically removed um, once the data gets to Frida. But we keep the capability in there um, for people who have not gone through the core MS pipeline. Okay. Uh, you, you can also, you know, we, we usually come in with things like, as I said, elemental counts, but there are various other values of interest uh, um, but as i've said biologists have come to us and say we, we, we find these of interest that you can calculate uh, from those elemental counts and so a very simple one is something like elemental ratios right you have hydrogen counts you have carbon counts what's the ratio of hydrogen to carbon for a particular peak um, other things include you know, double bond equivalent Gibbs free energy uh, and Krebelin boundary sets. So uh, we'll see those later. Van Krebelin boundary sets are essentially used to um, um, do sort of a classification of each peak. Um, you know, things like aromaticity, uh, Kendrick mass and defect. These are going to be used to to um, make some Kendrick plots. You'll you'll see later. Um, Nominal oxidation state of carbon, uh, and of course, uh, elemental composition as well, if your data has not already come with, with that. Um, and at the bottom there, of course, we've provided functions to pass this data object to, and it will calculate these and add them all to that e-meta file that we showed earlier. So the right there, this is actually a um visual a panel from Frida showing sort of the distribution of hydrogen to carbon ratio across all your peaks so this is the sort of thing you want to do in exploratory data analysis you, you calculate some value of interest across all um, observations in this case peaks and plot its distribution a very common thing to do um, and I didn't get the full picture in here, but you're about to see it in the next slide. And you extrapolate out, this full plot looks something like this. So this is the kind of thing that you, you do exploratory data analysis for, right? You look at this graph and you say, that's a very strange tale of high hydrogen and carbon ratios going off to the right. Um, now, someone with background knowledge, uh, uh, you know, can make a better judgment call as to whether or not uh, these peaks corresponding to these high hydrogen carbon emissions are, are valid or not. Okay, so we've calculated all these extra uh, measurements of interest. We've added them to our, our metadata. Uh, and now we want to sort of filter out peaks that we think are not of interest to us. Uh, Frida provides several uh, ways to do this. One of the most common ones is to just filter out peaks that are outside a particular mass range. And the reason we do this is um, we essentially don't trust the instrument's measurements outside of a particular range. And so uh, kind of a, a, you know, a rule of thumb value is between 200 and 100. And this is going to probably uh, uh, change depending on the instrument. Um, these filters function similarly to what Natalie described. You create your filter object. You say, I want a filter object that, that you know, uh, looks at the mass of this data. And then you apply that filter to your data saying, get rid of everything that's below 200 and above 900 mass. Right. Things that don't have a molecular form. It's pretty easy. Look at the column of the molecular formula. If there's an NA there, chop that, uh, chop that to you. And some other ones uh, have too many missing values. So if you, <laughs> uh, uh, the more uh, uh, attentive among you may have noticed that uh, that e data file had a lot of missing values. There are probably ten times as many as actual actual measurements. Um, this is, of course, 
bad. We would like to see everything, but that's just not how it pans out in, in FDMS data. Um, uh, so we say, okay, if, if the peak doesn't have at least two, that's kind of a rule, another rule of, of thumb value we use, two per group, um, then we get rid of that peak. Uh, the main reason we do this is we just want to have uh, uh, enough values to perform a valid statistical comparison. Um, the extreme example is, of course, if you have one actual observation per group, um, you're probably not going to be able to do real statistics. Um, and finally, here, kind of uh, referencing back to that plot I showed before, um, you can, for any of the variables you've calculated, oh, sorry, uh, such as hydrogen and carbon, these extra metadata values we've, we've calculated, you can filter based on those um, for any range of values. So for this plot, um, someone with background knowledge can make a call and say, you know, these peaks with high hydrogen carbonations are not legitimate. Apply a filter that filters out everything with hydrogen to carbon, hydrogen to carbon ratio above three, let's say. All right, uh, a shot of the actual app and the filtering panel. Uh, on the left here, various drop downs to um, show the filter types. We can see the mass filter, uh, the molecule filter, that's the one to filter for missing values, um, the formula presence filter uh, with the fourth down here, and then finally a custom filter where you just choose whichever of the ones, whichever of the variables you calculated choose a range of values and say, okay, get rid of stuff outside this range. All right, so we've ingested our data, we've done some pre-processing stuff like log transforming, calculating new variables of interest, um, getting rid of peaks that I think are just uh, not of interest to us or, or our impurities in the data. Now we get to make some plots. Uh, which is all anyone really wants to do, right? So uh, the, the backend package, uh, FDMSR analysis, has various types of plots that we implement in Prita. Um, and I'll, I'll show examples of these and try to give you a little bit of explanation as to what they're, they're showing. Uh, Van Cribble plots, um, Kentrick plots, density plots, scatter plots, uh, custom scatter plots, and um, some, some principal coordinate analysis plots. Okay, so the first one I'm going to show here is the uh, Van Krebelen plot. Uh, a general description of the Van Krebelen plot, you want to characterize the chemical composition of, of an element, uh, uh, sorry, characterize the chemical composition of the peak by its, its element ratios. Uh, specifically, if you can see this on the graph, uh, the hydrogen to carbon ratio and the oxygen to carbon ratio. And so, People have developed the various boundary sets um, that, that outline various uh, points in the hydrogen to carbon and versus oxygen to carbon uh, space. Let's say everything is here, everything in here has this particular uh, classification. So in this case, this is showing uh, what we've called boundary set one. Um, and I provided uh, references to these in the notes, but in this particular boundary set for this region of hydrogen to carbon ratio and oxygen to carbon ratio, they said these are carbohydrates. So this is probably the most common thing, at least that I've seen people do with Van Krebelen plots. They they have uh, kind of the, the defining characteristic is that it's plotting hydrogen to carbon ratio against oxygen to carbon ratio, and we overlay this various boundary sets that. Um, people have tried to claim in their publications are, are more valid or, or more useful in other boundary sets. Um, but you don't have to do that. We have all these extra variables we calculated. Um, you could choose any of them and, and color your plot by those. Um, so here's another uh, panel of the same plot in Frida, except instead of these boundary sets, we've colored it by carbon. Um, 
And again, this is the sort of thing you're looking for in exploratory data analysis. You see, ah, there's this, this clump of green peaks. Now, in this case, it's not <laughs> particularly uh, interesting because I'm coloring by, you'll notice carbon. Um, and you're like, wait, when you're plotting by hydrogen to carbon ratio on the y axis and oxygen to carbon ratio on the x axis. So you would expect that region um, to have high carbon counts. Um, but just to reiterate, you could do this again for, for any of the variables you calculated and for the people who are, are um, uh, going through the app, you'll, you'll see that you'll be able to do this. And similarly for the people who are going through the, the actual R package. Okay. Uh, finally, for Van Krebel bots, um, there's an option to color it by uniqueness to a group. Okay, so what does that mean? We, uh, if you'll remember, we defined groups uh, for all of our samples previously. So we've said samples A, B, C, D belong to group one, E, F, G, samples E, F, G belong to group two. Um, and we want to say for a particular peak, is it sort of unique to one of those groups? So the backend package does this for you, um, and then you can essentially plot for each peak. Oh, and in case I did not make this clear, sorry, each point in this plot represents one peak. Um, and so, for example, you know, this green dot at the top left. Um, previously, we calculated both the hydrogen to carbon ratio and an oxygen to carbon ratio for that peak. We have that data, and so we can plot it at this point in the graph. So uh, in this case, we're saying, is this particular peak unique to a group? So we've said, yes, in this case, it is unique to group one. And you might ask, how do you determine whether it's unique? Uh, Frida and FPMSR analysis currently have Two options. One is just to look at um, is there more missingness uh, uh, in one group than another? So for a particular peak, do, do the measurements of that peak go missing in the one group more than they do in the other group? Um, and you can just you know, obviously just count that, um, but we also provide an actual statistical test um, for that. I won't go into it in too much detail, but essentially it says, you know, you expect the amount of missingness in both of the groups to be the same. If you see evidence that that's not true, then you say it's unique to a particular group. Okay. Uh, and I guess final note in this plot, you, you, you know, there is, as far as exploratory data analysis goes, you you do see sort of this cluster of peaks that are unique to group one, kind of in the the high carbon area that we identified from from the previous um, plot. So you can see this is sort of the high carbon region of the Van Krebel plot. Okay, uh, the other kind of most common plot is this Kendrick plot. Um, so this is something, again, we've calculated these, this Kendrick defect and Kendrick mass in the pre-processing. Uh, and we're going to plot that Kendrick defect, defect against the nominal Kendrick mass. So if you notice on um, this graph, some of these peaks lie along uh, these horizontal lines. Uh, and essentially what that is, is that ions of the same family are going to lie along the same horizontal line. Um, a common analysis people do uh, is to compare this with Van Krebelen diagram categories. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the, the categories we saw on this, this slide back here. Um, you know, color each peak by its category. Um, but of course, we provide the option to, to color it by any variable you calculated, in this case, carbon. Yeah. Um, should look familiar. Uh, we also provide the option for this plot to do the, the group comparison. Um, 
again, you do see a little bit of a pattern in this data where the peaks that are unique to group two and the peaks that are unique to group one uh, occupy different regions uh, in the Kendrick plot. All right, so density plots. These ones are not quite as intuitive because we don't have these nice uh, little points on the graph. Um, but essentially what we're doing is that we, we, we consider a variable, let's say oxygen to carbon ratio for, for this particular plot. Um, how many peaks are associated with that value relative to the rest of the values? So I'll try to explain with this uh, particular plot here. So I'm highlighting this purple line here uh, for this particular sample. Um, you can see it has a lot of the peaks in that sample um, have oxygen to carbon ratios around 0.4. Um, and this is a way you can sort of uh, compare the um, uh, the values between samples. So clearly there's something going, there's something different going on in terms of oxygen to carbon ratio uh, between the samples represented by the purple and uh, green lines as opposed to the samples represented by the rest of the lines. And maybe you could even argue that uh, uh, yellow and blue are different than red and orange. Um, they have high density at, at, at 0.2, but um, a little bit more for red and orange. Um, and we have not included this as a test in, in Frida yet, but uh, there are actual statistical tests you can run to say, is the purple line, uh, the purple density line different than the blue density line? Okay. You know, we've calculated all these variables. We've got, you know, however many you, you, you've included in your e-meta file, seemed uh, only right to allow users to make a scatter plot based on any combination of, of those variables. So as a kind of arbitrary example here, I've just shown that in Frida you can, I've chosen Gibbs free energy on the y-axis and my favorite seems for this presentation, oxygen to carbon ratio uh, on the x-axis. And you can see this uh, sort of strange pattern. Um, in this particular plot, again, the points representing the peaks. So uh, multidimensional scaling or PCLA, it's fine if you don't know what these are, but so you know, each sample has many features. That is to say it has many values for each peak. Um, we want to be able to, you know, plot each sample in a two-dimensional space and see if they have some sort of uh, uh, characteristic difference between them uh, um, in, a, in a lower dimensional space, basically. So PCOA is one way to do this. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, and in this case, you can see the samples. Now, the crucially, the points here represent samples, not peaks. Um, uh, and they separate into two uh, distinct groups here. And so again, this is the sort of thing you want to see in exploratory data analysis. Aha, there's some separation between my samples. What is it? Um, and if I had more slides, I would probably include a few more coloring them by various um, uh, group assignments for each sample. Okay. Trying to think if there's something else I should explain in this plot. Mm. Yeah, I guess just in case it's confusing, you know, uh, each sample is represented by, you know, thousands and thousands of peaks. We reduce that down to each sample is just represented by two measurements now, okay? Because we want to be able to plot this thing. Those two measurements are given on the X and Y axes. Hey, Daniel. Yes. I'm giving you the two minute warning. Okay. Yes. Pretty, pretty close here. We're getting to the end. All right. Uh, some cool extra features on Frida uh, linked plots, 
So if you have two plots, you can compare regions of each of those scatter plots to things like density plots. And so um, I think the best is just to give an example of that. So on the right here, I've lassoed these points and it shows you the corresponding density plot for this particular sample, uh, where those points lie as in, uh, in, in terms of their uh, carbon counts. So just a little cool feature for you. Uh, another example, you can you know, have it in your density plot, you can compare a uh, Kremlin plot and a Kendrick plot. Um, and there's some functionality which we're still developing, which is to map peaks to uh, databases such as Keg and uh, Metasec, which give you various information shown here. Uh, just an example of that screen where we've got the peak, uh, things like formula compounds, reactions. Uh, and finally, uh, there's sort of a problem where people are passing sheets back and forth and nobody knows what, you know, what has happened to this data before it got to me. Um, so Frida allows you to uh, export sort of a, uh, a report about what happened to the data. So you give some of the data you processed and analyzed and you give them this report as well. Okay, so that's it for the exploratory data analysis section. So up next, uh, um, we've got David with um, uh, a little bit of uh, stuff on differential abundance.